Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Jesus and Coffee Time, an inspirational hour right here on 980 WCAP. I'm your host, Ashley Elizabeth. It's so great to be on with you today. We're going on week eight here with you. So it's, this is our eighth show this morning. So praise God for that. The first half of our show, we always tackle what's going on in the national news what people are talking about. We want to give you the facts so that you can make an informed decision on your own. When we come back halfway through our program, after our our commercial break, we do have an inspirational, uplifting story to share, as well as a time of devotion in God's Word. So I'm so glad that you're here. Again, you can come and join us every Tuesday at 10. If you ever have any questions, you're welcome to reach out to me, Ashley, at AshleyElizabeth.com. And you can always go to the website, AshleyElizabeth.com, for more inspiration. (sighs) And information. (laughs) Sounds like you needed your coffee this morning. I do. So yes, you get inspiration, but you also get more information about the ministry. There you go. On AshleyElizabeth.com. Okay. Well, anyways, I'm going to grab myself another cup of coffee. I'm going to pass the ball over to Justin. That's right. I'm here too. Good morning, everyone. (laughs) All right. Well, before I do that, there's a couple things that I want to say about immigration because that is the topic we're talking about today. I've heard a lot about this and some of the things that I've heard... And in conversations I've had with different people, you know, the borders are open, people are coming in in droves, we have this massive crisis going on right now, Biden's administration has opened everything up, there's kids in cages, a lot of these people have COVID. I've heard some other talking points, such as, you know, the Democrats are trying to grow their voter base. I've also heard things about terrorists, right? Terrorists are trying to come o- come over, and that's why we're seeing this. I mean, all different things. So I want to pass the ball to you, Justin, to talk about what is really going on right now, and is this really a crisis? Kind of. It, it's a crisis in the sense of the immigration system's been in crisis for the last 30 years. It's broken, and it doesn't work, and it needs to be fixed. So from that perspective, yes, like there is an immigration crisis. But what's currently going on at the border is not a crisis by any stretch of the imagination. To first address that whole idea of open borders, which is a common talking point that you hear from some segments of the political spectrum, it's, again, it's really disingenuous. The border is not open. The only people that are even being considered for admission are asylum seekers, that's the only category of the, all the different kinds of people who might show up at the border. It's just people seeking asylum. And for people who don't understand asylum, the legal definition of asylum is you're seeking entry into the United States because of a particularized threat from where you come from, whether it's political violence, some type of economic issue, like actual like violence from the police, gang violence, um, and different types of perse- religious persecution, things like that. So... That's those are the only categories of people who are allowed in. And, and within that category, the Biden administration is only considering unaccompanied children and certain families with children. That's it. OK, so the borders when I hear the borders are open, there's panic, too. That oh, sure. Com- comes from the people who are saying it. I mean, they, they make it sound like literally we're like waving banners. I mean, like, come on in. Like, you know, we're just getting overwhelmed and, and these people are just allowed to just come in and do whatever they want. That's how it sounds to me. Oh, sure. If you listen to the media and it's not, it, this isn't to to kind of point the finger at one side or the other on the political spectrum. Like you're seeing this narrative from the, just the generalized media across ideologies. You've seen it. Again, I remember stuff like this when I was a kid, snippets I'd see on the news about border crisis and, and all these different things. It's this narrative we've heard for 30 years. And it's interesting that if you look at people who study the psychological effect of what you consume, the information you consume, and on this particular issue, it has this effect that overwhelmingly, like 95%, I think it was, of stories about immigration in the media, again, across all media, print and television and radio, and across ideology, so left, right, and everything in between, 95% of the stories are overwhelmingly negative. And so it's created this idea in the American consciousness over the last 25, 30 years that immigration is just this bad thing. Well, it demonizes it. It does. And the currency is fear. But we know that this is what sells. Just as much as sex sells, right? We hear that in television and movies. Like the fear of issues like this also drives clicks and sales. And this, this is just one of the most egregious examples. So really nobody's off the hook. That makes sense. And the other thing, too, I wanted to address quickly is kids in cages. Right. Because that's the other thing. I've even seen people sharing memes of pictures of kids in, in, you know, these holding cells and, you know, with various captions. But what's the deal with that? So there's a tiny sliver of truth to it. And explaining this has requires us to back up a bit. Up until 2014, 
So we're talking about, since they've been really tracking this since the 80s, up until 2014, the average, overwhelmingly, 80% of the time, the average person appearing at the border, immigration-wise, is an adult male person of Mexican heritage seeking employment. In 2014, they started to see government, a market shift. It was a lot more unaccompanied minors, so that's kids without, just alone, right, of all ages. 70% of the time, they're teenagers, but there's also, it's interesting, it's they're either teenagers or they're under 12. There's like that kind of middle ground doesn't seem to exist numbers-wise, which is just, you know, neither here nor there. Interesting, yeah. It's either unaccompanied minors or it's young families with kids. And so what's driving this shift? In 20, since 2014, um, these people are arriving largely from not Mexico, but what's called the Northern Triangle countries of Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. Starting around that period, that co- those countries, which up until that point had been generally decent places to live. I mean, I, that's a generalization, but they weren't like in crisis. Um, they started to see market declines in government, how things were run in economics, in food security, in water security, job security, housing security. And this just got compounded over time, a huge increase in violent crime and gang violence against normal people. It's interesting that outside of the Middle East, which for obvious reasons is the most dangerous place in the world, this is the second most dangerous place in the world to live um, because of the violence. So it's a, it was a huge increase in that. And then in the last couple of years, they've been walloped by all these storms that are being driven by climate change, two of which category four storms came in 2020 and basically demolished large swaths of these countries, just gone, like completely gone. And so it, the government estimates that that negatively affected about 15 million people. And weren't we sending aid? We have been. And historically, for at different levels under different administrations, they send aid to try to keep these countries doing well and to rebuild them to decrease the incentive. Under the Trump administration, he revoked about $4 billion in aid to these countries. So that only worsened it. When these hurricanes came, it was catastrophic. Right. So they don't have help. And then they try to come and seek asylum if right. they can. Which right. makes sense. I would do that too, especially with family. You know, if I had kids and I was living in a place that was dangerous, I'd want to seek asylum somewhere and, and, and try to make a better life for my family for sure. 100%. Oh, 100%. And that ex- so that explains the families and the kids. A lot of these kids are coming without their parents because of the cost, number one. And number two is because the government's found that roughly 80% of them already have relatives living in the U.S. So that explains why we're seeing kids and we're seeing families. And it also ex- that's part of the reason why we're seeing so many of them now. Now, the kids in the cages thing, that's what you brought up. It's true in the sense that of this. The way the border generally works is that there's two agencies that are related to border security. One is Customs and Border Enforcement, that they're the ones charged with securing the border. And they are the ones who apprehend people and also process people who come the normal way and just want to come in through the normal channels. When it's kids, especially unaccompanied kids, they are required to transfer these kids that they've processed through the system within 72 hours to the Department of Health and Human Services, who is then required to house them until they can either set them up with a sponsor, like through a foster system, or get them to a relative or someone already living in the U.S. The problem is when there's so many, the system... And to back up a little bit, the system is chronically and historically underfunded and under-resourced. And so they can only handle so many a day. So when you bring more, Customs and Border Enforcement is required to hang on to them because they can't transfer them to Health and Human Services because they don't have enough space. So part of addressing the problem is increasing the amount of money that we put towards these programs. Oh, yeah. It's been historically underfunded for for decades. It's, it's It's always been too few resources. Despite having the largest and most complex immigration system in the world, it's also, for the U.S., it's also like chronically underfunded. That's true. So Customs and Border Enforcement can't process these kids fast enough. Health and Human Services can't take them fast enough. The prior administration dismantled a lot of this physical infrastructure, like a lot of the housing buildings they took down because their whole policy was, well, you know about the family separations. They were forcibly separating kids from their families at the border, about 5,000 families as a deterrent to keep people from coming here. They didn't want people to come here. They had all these programs to keep them in Mexico and these other countries while they waited for their claims to be processed instead of following federal and international law and processing them through our own centers. So they dismantled a lot of this. So the Biden administration is literally like building buildings to help process all these people. But in the meantime, they're kind of stuck holding on to the kids because it's, it's this, you have to make a choice. 
either they're going to live in these makeshift refugee camps, basically, in Mexico or some other country, where we know for a fact that human traffickers prey on unaccompanied kids and they live in squalor, or we can let them process through the system in the United States and wait here in a facility or with a relative until their case comes up for asylum. And how many kids got released under the previous administration yeah, just six, at the border unaccompanied? Six, they, they released some about 16,000 unaccompanied kids back into Mexico without supervision. And I'm, I'm sorry, but human trafficking is a real thing. And hmm. these predators, I mean, hearing about that, I'm sure they were at the border waiting for these kids. And you know what? I'm not saying here or there are taking a political stance, but I don't care what administration it is. That is not okay. That's not okay. Agreed. And, and this current administration made that decision that on humanitarian grounds, that's why they're processing unaccompanied kids and certain families with kids. And to give people some numbers, there are about 466 unaccompanied kids arriving at the border daily. At the same time, there are about another 1,900 people arriving daily that constitute families with kids. So you're talking about 2,500 people a day are arriving at the border and being processed through the system. In addition, there's about 100,000 people, again, just families with kids, that have been waiting in Mexico under the previous administration's policies that, again, we are legally required to process. But these numbers are not crisis numbers. They're not crisis numbers. I mean, we looked at the numbers from years past, and even under the previous administration, pre-COVID, the, the numbers and of people at the border, it was a lot. Oh, it was insane. And, I mean, I don't even, do you have some numbers that you could share yeah. with us? Yeah. Um, beginning in the 1980s, about 2,000 people a day across all different types of immigration appeared at the border. By 2000, that had risen to 20,000 a day. By 2016, that had risen to an average of 33,000 a day. Um, by 2019, it was about 50,000 a day. Um, I'm sorry, a month. All of those numbers are by the month. Excuse me. By the month. So now, now who needs coffee? Not by the day. Yeah, well, I'm not a coffee drinker. <laughs> See? I'm not a coffee drinker. Um, so by 2019, we're talking about an average of 50,000 a day, starting in 2019. In a, the, a day or a month? A month, I'm sorry. <laughs> in the year 2019, so just in that year, that number raised, rose to about 85,000 a month. So across the entire year of 2019, you saw an average of 85,000 people appearing at the border a month, Right. That's over a million people a year. That was the real surge. If you want to talk about a surge, that was the real surge in 2019. And what, the only thing that stopped it was COVID. So I don't know. We can't really speculate as to what would have happened, how the previous administration would have handled it. But they were seeing almost 100,000 people a month appearing at the border uh, on average. A month. And a so month. as yes, compared to now a month, what do we see? Well, like I said, I mean, you can do the math yourself. It's about 2,500 people a day. So like do the math. Uh, you know, was that fifty thousand? Yeah, it's it's still up there. It's still but fifty, it, but it's, it's still, about half. But it's still about half of what okay. they were seeing in twenty nineteen, and that's yes, that that's part of it too. So we talked about all that. So the kids in cages thing, it's because Customs and Border Patrol, to go back, has to hang on to these kids in their detention facilities until they can release them to Health and Human Services, which is frantically trying to build build back enough capacity to take these kids. And we're talking about like twenty five hundred people a day processing through it still overwhelms the system the other thing that i hear a lot is you know why do these people need to come here right we've got too many as it is right. and right the numbers are gonna overwhelm us and why should our um, welfare systems you know have to to care for these people and these are just things that i've heard but i want to address some of that because honestly i mean people have the have the right and if they come here seeking asylum we also know that it's only, what, about 40% of asylum seekers that even get granted that status as it is. So right. it's not like everybody's being let in. Right. And our population's also decreasing, which is another thing as mm. well, right? We've talked about that. We have. Those are all good points, right, to address. And that, that kind of provides context to this. You're right. Number one, if it wasn't for immigration, the United States population would shrink. And not for nothing, but we're all immigrants. Yes. I'm, my great-grandparents on my dad's side... So this is my grandparents' parents came from Ireland. And on my mom's side, my grandparents' parents came from Albania. So mm. by all means, that makes my family line Im immigrants. Oh, sure. And my, my uh, grandparents' parents also came from Portugal. So, on both sides, basically. Right. So saying like we shouldn't open our borders or defining them as these people. I mean, I'm sorry. It just it comes into I, I think there's some racism at play here or at least some discrimination the, from some of the things I hear or maybe it's ignorance I don't know it, it's, it's a lot of those things all mixed together 
But the context is important. And like I said, the birth rate in the United States has declined to the point where without immigration, the population would begin to shrink over the next 50 years. A shrinking population will shrink an economy because you have more and more people aging and retiring and less and less young people coming up, not only to work to drive the economy, but to pay for the retirement life of old people who can't work anymore. And so without a certain amount of immigration keeping everything rolling, the country would shrink. It's happening. It's been happening in Russia for the past 20 years. And part of the reason why Putin is such a jerk is because, and all of his policies are the way they are about other countries, is because his country is shrinking. And so he's, he's like the guy whose army, you know, he's losing more and more power every year, economically, militarily. So he gets louder and louder to compensate because he's weaker and weaker in reality. Mm. That's part of it. We don't want the U.S. to be like that. So immigration is part of that. Right. So you, you said about that was that well, we don't have enough room. Well, you know, there's 330 million people in this country. There's plenty of room. There's a lot of room. Like, and so like to talk and, about and we're not talking about millions of people. No, we're not even talking about hundreds of thousands because of people. You brought up that important statistic. Only about historically 40 percent of asylum seekers actually get in. And these are people who are coming here and seeking asylum because of it's for the right reasons let me put it that way persecution of various kinds right. economic and they're they're doing it the right way political they're yes. coming here and saying i want to get processed this is why i'm coming this is who i am you know they want to become a part of our system they're not trying to like run over fences or you know try to sneak in on bo- on boats right. right i mean all the other right everybody but us like and you said it already everybody but asylum seekers aren't just being expelled Right now. And of the asylum seekers, only kids and certain families with kids are even being considered. And, and then of the ones even... Right. 80% of those kids have family here already. Right. And then of the people that are being considered, uh, other than the kids who already have the family here, right? Of the normal families where they're being considered, only about 40% actually stay. Everybody else gets expelled. And even right now, we have a lot of illegal immigrants here who are yes. so afraid of just getting kicked out and they pay taxes. They don't get to claim at the end of the year to get any no. money back, but a lot of them pay taxes. I've even known some. Most of them do. As a sidebar. And they're, you know, okay, they're here and maybe their visa's expired or whatever, but they work, they work hard. You know, they, again, pay taxes. They don't get anything back at the end of the year, but they're afraid sure. of just being deported. But there has to be some type of process in place for them too. I, I, th- yes. I think so. I agree with you. And that's something we can talk about towards the end about why the system is the way it is and how we can fix it. You're right. There is about 14 million, that's an estimate, about 14 million people currently living in the United States without legal status for various reasons. There's a hundred different reasons why. And that's a whole population of people. And we can talk about that at the end. Um, I think because that's a good point and that kind of leads us into like where this is going and everything. But right now, just to reiterate everything we've been talking about, the only people that are even being allowed in, unaccompanied kids and certain families with kids, of those people allowed in, they're processed through, only if they have an asylum claim, they're processed through the asylum system, they're given a court date, they have to go through the whole asylum process, and then only four out of 10 get to stay. So you're, you're talking about a minuscule amount of people. And just to give you a statistic, since in the last year, so 2020, because the numbers, obviously COVID has like, put the, a wallop on a lot of stuff, in, uh, immigration being one of them. Of the, in the last year, in 2020, about 650,000 people were expelled from the border. And less than half of 1% were even allowed in, and then those people had to go through the processing, and again, only about four out of every 10 got to stay. So we're talking about a minuscule amount of people. And so we've talked about a lot of the reasons why they come, right? They're, they're largely families and unaccompanied kids coming from an area, the second most dangerous area of the world that has basically no economic, political, social prospects at all. And a lot of them not, don't even have food security or water security or house, right? So we know this. There's also the season to consider. Historically, every year from between February to June, there's an increase in people who will come to the border because it's the safest time of year to come weather-wise. It's the nicest weather. It's the least hot, right? So that's part of this too. So we have all these things. And then finally, like we were talking about, the last one I'd like to touch on, the policies of the Trump administration have contributed to the current acuteness of why these numbers are the way they are now. Not to say that it's his administration's fault for the last 30 years of immigration, because as we're going to get to, that's part of the problem. But like I said, his refusal to even process immigration uh, asylum claims through the immigration system at all 
completely shutting down the border to anybody and forcing a lot of people to remain in Mexico or wherever else basically just deferred all these people coming. So And COVID obviously helped too. So now that COVID's starting to wind down a little bit and the Biden administration, like I said, has determined that allowing these people to just remain in these refugee camps, most of whom are kids, right? Most of these people aren't accompanied kids that are subject to mistreatment and maltreatment and sex trafficking on humanitarian grounds, we at least have to process their claims. So that's really what's changed at the border. And that's what we're seeing. And so all of those things kind of that's that's why in the near term, why we see what we see right now. And that's a much different narrative than what you'll hear if you put on Fox News or these other media outlets. And that's just bad reporting, in my opinion. It is. And it's, again, like I said, it's the narrative that they've done because it sells. It's easy to sell crisis. But, and it is complex, right? I mean, this isn't easy stuff. It's not readily available information. Um, but it's out there. And hope, you'd hope that the media would do their homework and talk about it in this way, but they don't. And I'm sure there's political agendas behind it as well. Oh, probably. Yeah, you're certainly right about that. Sure. So I think the last thing before we really get into like some the biblical ramifications of all this is just why on a longer term, like the American system, like why it looks this way, why does this keep happening and how can we fix it? So the system lacks the facility to process people who want to come here legally. We have this whole patchwork of different visas for work and like temporary visas, right? And H-1B-1 visas and this whole underground system of seasonal workers where something like 2 million um, South American and Mexican people cross the border every year to go work on all the farms in California and then they go back because it's seasonal work and that's just kind of like just been allowed to develop over the last 30 years. Um, But the system is designed entirely around the idea of deterrence and detention. Like I said, we have the most well-developed system like that in the world and so a lot like the prison system, which we've talked about already a little bit, is all built around retribution and trying to scare people into not committing crimes. And and a lot of the other ideas that we've seen since the 1980s, trickle-down economics, cutting taxes for the rich, the whole idea of the welfare system that we kind of touched on when we talked about the COVID bill, um, crime like we just talked about. And then this immigration, the way the immigration system is set up, it doesn't work. Deterring people in this way, not having some type of avenue to process people who want to come here legally doesn't work. It just, I've read the numbers and in the eighties, it was 2000 people a day, right? And then by 2019, it was a hundred thousand people a month. It's, it's only grown. It's only gotten worse. And the, the fixes are out there. I mean, people know what needs to be done and there's been, they've tried to since I don't, can't speak to the nineties, but I know in three or four times in the 2000s, 2006, 2013, times before that, the government has tried to pass comprehensive immigration reform that provides a vehicle for people who want to move to the United States and immigrate here legally to have a system, to process asylum claims, to have enough resources, and also to be able to deter the type of people who don't fit these definitions in a humane way. But it hasn't happened. And it, it's, you know, like it's... So it's there's systemic changes. Oh, it's that's the systemic issue. And, and the incentive to come right now is, is kind of perverse because it's easier to get in through an overburdened system than it would be to go through legal channels, right? If, if there was a legal channel for people to come, number one, if there was a good and robust asylum system that complied with international and federal law, because right now it doesn't, even now, let alone under the previous administration, it just doesn't. Um, if there was, and you touched on this, the 14 million people currently living here without legal status, as much as some people probably don't want to hear this, like the reality is, um, and this is practically and legally, there has to be some mechanism to give them at least the opportunity to get citizenship. You can't deport 14 million people. It's just, it would cost, it would take you decades, it would cost too much money. It's just impossible. So there has to be some fix. And to its credit, the current administration has put forth an idea. I don't know if people in Congress will consider it. But it's conditional. You'd have to, like you talked about, you'd have to pay your taxes. You'd have to have a job. No criminal record. You'd have to be established in a community and making, you'd have to pass the citizenship test, which is very difficult. I've seen it. It, Quite frankly, I would say the average American high school student would not be able to pass a citizenship test. So it's difficult. And go through all this process. But giving people a legal status allows them, like you said, they could work legally. They don't have to worry about 
um, being detained and released at a moment's notice, they can more fully integrate into the community and they would also be able to more fully integrate into civic life and participate in all the different things with all the rights that, that people born in the United States would have. And by doing that, it decreases the incentive to come and they won't be exploited. And so that's what needs to happen. But for various reasons, we haven't seen that. One of the main ones being there's just it's, there's no political will on the right. Not to, you know, I, we are middle of the road, but the reality of the situation is the Republican Party r- obtains a lot of its voter identity and a lot of its voter people coming back more and more over and over again. It's, I guess, you know, getting people to stay. Immigration is a hot button issue. It works in large swaths of this country to talk about things the way like open borders and all this stuff that we talked about. So there's no... Honestly, it rallies hate. It does. It does rally hate. And like you talked about, all these other perverse prejudices and things. But it politically, it works. So they have there's not a lot of incentive on that side to do it. And so they don't even engage. I mean, a lot of the Democrats' ideas, I think, are too much. They, they probably want to let in too many people and whatever. But there's no compromise. Like when, they, when there's no will to even engage and say, well, you think you want to do X. How about, you know, and I want to do Y. How about we come somewhere and compromise a little bit and do Z? There's no, there's no engagement and, at all. And that's how politics is supposed to that's work. That's how life works. Right. That's how marriage works. Well, politics... <laughs> Hey, that's for another day, okay? <laughs> but seriously, like, isn't that how life just works in general, typically? Give and take, yeah. Oh, is it give and take? Like, you're not going to get 100% of what you want, and the other person doesn't either, but you try to work with people and find something out that works. But that that's part of the problem here. And there's too much of an incentive for big business, and this is another thing, and this comes up a lot too, but big business has an incentive to create a permanent underclass of people who they can exploit. I mean, th- that's the bottom line. And this this isn't new. It's a, it is a dirty little secret, though. This isn't new. I mean, you could go back to the turn of the 20th century, right before the Great Depression, and read, and I've done this, I've read books and the histories behind it. People realized, and at the time, this it was Chinese immigration, people from mainland China. They could let in a few million of these people, get them to work at wages that they couldn't afford to pay Americans, American citizens, because... These people had no clout. They had no economic and political voice. And they would just be a permanent class of people. who, And they could keep them afraid. We'll deport you. We'll whatever, right? If you don't work at these horrible conditions. And that happens in this country. So just the farm workers alone. There's a million and a half to two million seasonal farm workers who work for pennies to pick strawberries in California. I mean, it's just the truth. And these companies make a ton of money because they pay them nothing compared to what they'd have to pay American workers. And they're in and out. They and come in for right. that season and then they have to go back. And if they live here... It kind of sounds like exploitation to me. They live in the shadows because they're afraid of getting deported because this is the only work they have. Sad. So there's a, you know, the business lobby pushes against this. The private prisons push against this too because they have an incentive to help Customs and Border Enforcement run these detention facilities because the government hasn't put enough resources behind it. And all the stuff that comes from that. And that's another issue for another day. So what you're seeing again is money. There's a, there's a lot of money to be made to keep this class of people in this country and without legal status. And there's a lot of money to be made and political clout to be made demonizing uh, what's happening at the border. And the, me- the media makes a lot of money off of all of this. And so it's this perfect storm of, of this crap. Well, we're over time for our first half, but is there anything else that you wanted to address before we take a break? Just just a biblical perspective real quick. I think I would hope it's kind of obvious to people that, you know, compassion understanding what's going on, understanding other people's fellow humanity. Like you said, put yourself in their shoes for a second. That you live in a country that wasn't that great to begin with, quite honestly, that has all these problems. You can't get a job. You can't get food. You can't get water. There's a gang next door that's extorting you. The government wants to extort you to protect you. What else are you going to do? No matter how bad you might be treated at the border of the United States, wouldn't you at least try? Mm. And shouldn't there be some compassion and understanding? And shouldn't there be some understanding of the issues so that people, you can vote intelligently, that you can talk about it intelligently, you can understand it that way, right? There's more There's more to the story. And Well, scripture, you can even read scriptures that talk about loving the stranger. Yeah. And welcoming them and feeding them and exactly. clothing them. Right? And the, the Israelites were given that, I think, through the law of Moses. Not to say they were under the law, but it's good to understand at least the compassionate oh, side of it. Here you go, Deuteronomy 10.19. Therefore, love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Right. And so... And that's not to say there aren't a lot of Christian organizations that are doing great work down there. But like the church as a whole, I think, has to kind of understand the policy implications behind this and take a good hard look at, well, how has my vote contributed to this? And is that important to you? Mm, I think that's all part of this. That's fair. That's part of being wise to me. 
All right. Well, we're going to wrap up this first half. I want to say thank you, Justin, for being here and, and bringing your lawyer knowledge. <laughs> Such as it is. <laughs> right. Um, and thank you to the listeners for uh, for being here with us this morning. We're going to take a quick break. You're tuned into Jesus and Coffee Time on right here on 980 WCAP, Voice of the Valley. Everybody gets it. I'm your host, Ashley Elizabeth. We'll be back in just a few. right here on 980 WCAP, Voice of the Valley. Everybody gets it. I'm your host, Ashley Elizabeth. You can come and join me every Tuesday right here at 10 a.m. for an inspirational hour. Well, we are in our second half of our program this morning, so we're going to get started here in our uplifting story of the week. I'm going to take you to Washington, D.C. Billy Adams in June decided that he wanted to do something to help during the pandemic, and he was tired of sitting around. So what does he do? He leaves his Maryland home every morning at 8.30 a.m., gets on the D.C. line, and he basically uses his hands to pick up trash for three hours. So he walks for 12 miles, and he actually stops to halfway through to replenish to get a clean trash bag. He picks up a coffee from a Starbucks on Canal Road in Georgetown. He actually tips them well, too. There was a comment in the article I read about that as well picks up another clean trash bag, and continues on his journey. So he does 12 miles every day around D.C. picking up litter. I love that. He's active. He's doing something to give back. And the employees at the M Street Starbucks call the 54-year-old garbage guy. (laughs) And they often have a bag ready for him when he stops in to buy coffee. I love that. Doing something to make the world a better place. If we all just did a little bit more, think of how much better the world would be, right? Even right in our backyards, in our neighborhoods. All right, well, this morning we're going to open in a word of prayer, and then we're going to get into our time of devotion in God's word. Thank you, Lord. Father, we give you thanks and praise today. Lord, we thank you for who you are. Father, we thank you for this holy week. Lord, we thank you for sending Jesus. We thank you so much for your blood, Jesus, that was shed for us and for the remission of our sins. And and Lord, this week we just celebrate you and we give you praise and we sit in remembrance of, of what you've done for us and what you do for us every day. Lord, we invite you into this space. Come and have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Can I get an amen this morning? Well, I want to talk today about what we are willing to give up. And giving things up can be challenging for us as people, especially if we feel that we've worked hard for something or we feel that we deserve something, right? Maybe we feel like we're owed. It can be very challenging for us to get that flesh in check and give things up. I want to start here because it is the Holy Week and, you know, we just had Palm Sunday Um, this past Sunday. We're coming into Resurrection Sunday where Jesus rose after three days in the grave. So I want to take you to John 3.16. This is a popular scripture. Probably most of us know it. I'm in the New King James Version. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, what did God give? Right? What did God give up? He gave up his only begotten Son, Jesus, for us. And that's what we celebrate this week. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you for sending Jesus. Here, I want to read to you too. Peter 2, verses 21 through 25. Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. For himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. God sent us Jesus, and Jesus paid a debt he did not owe. In fact, in John 15, starting in verse 13, Jesus' word says, What greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends, and if you do whatever I command you, no longer do I call you servants. For a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give you. Jesus knew his plan. He knew the mission. 
Hallelujah. And Jesus was faithful to complete it. We know that Jesus was fully God. He knew no sin, right? He was the perfect, spotless, blameless lamb. It had to be that way. When he went to the cross for us, he paid a debt he did not owe. And Jesus, in his own words, says he calls us friends when we come into relationship with him. And when we're willing to give up our own desires, our own wants, doing things our own way, giving that up for something better, giving that up for him and God's direction for our life. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And what are some things that we give up? Well, 2 Timothy 1.7 says what? For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So, okay, we give up fear, we give up doubt, we give up worry and confusion, we give up doing things our own way. I mean, come on, how many times can we say, well, you know, I thought that this was what I should do, or that was the way I should go, or I didn't want to give this up in my life, so I continued to wrestle with it, and in the end, it just got me into a worse place than where I started. How many times do we just continue to to dig that hole deeper and deeper and deeper? Well, Jesus says, well, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I know that I want life. And I know that I'm thankful to Jesus that he came and he completed the mission. And not only was he fully God, but he was also fully man, right? He was born to the Virgin Mary. Fully man, understands our pain understands what it's like to truly feel pain and to experience things. And we even know that when he was in the garden, he got on his face in Matthew 26, 39. It says what? When he was in the garden of Gethsemane, what does it say? He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, that as I will, but as you will, Lord, if there's any other way, Father, if there's any other way than to me have for me having to go to the cross, please let it be done. But nonetheless, your will be done, not mine. Right? As people, sometimes don't we have questions for God? Questions as to why something's going a certain way in our life or questions as to his plan. Sometimes it's like, Lord, you know, can I trust you in this? Or God, what are you doing here? Father, you're asking me to give this up. God, what am I going to get in return, right? We can have questions. And we see Jesus, the night before he would pay that debt he didn't owe for us. Hallelujah. And by his stripes, we know that we are healed. We know that by his blood that was shed, we are, we are forgiven if we choose to accept him. But in that garden, we see the human side of Jesus, Right? He's crying out to his father. So guess what? Jesus understands. And that means that if he's also fully God, God understands. God understands where you are right now. God understands what you've been through. God understands the struggle. God knows how hard it is to give things up. But there's a higher calling and a greater purpose to all things in our lives. Hallelujah. And you know what? I don't mind giving up fear and doubt and worry and confusion. We know that God is what? He's the author of peace. And we know that the end enemy is the one who comes to steal, cheat, kill, destroy, right? The enemy is the author of confusion. And how many times in our own lives do we author our own confusion? Can I get an amen this morning? Jeremiah 29 11 says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Hallelujah. God wants to give us a future and not just a mundane future, not just a future where we just kind of go through life or the waves of life hit us and take us over and we get blown wherever the wind takes us and not a life where we're all bound up doing things our own way, right? Continuing to make the same mistakes of the past. You know, there are some where it's like they grew up in a certain environment. Their parents treated them a certain way or they saw certain things and they become that environment. And sometimes that's a good thing and other times it's not. Hear me on that, right? Maybe your parents had some addiction going on. Hey, I get it. My dad was an alcoholic. I get it. He was not there for my mom. He was not there for our family. He was unable to love anybody else because he couldn't love himself and he was trapped in addiction. But because my dad was an alcoholic doesn't mean that I'm going to be an alcoholic. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. And you know what? I'm not. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. And you know, that was a choice too that I had to make. 
And you know, in my life, I had gone through a period where I chose to do things my own way, and I could have very easily fallen into addiction, but God is so good, and Jesus is still alive and well. Hallelujah. What does that mean? He works through people. Listen, I'm a product of a praying mom. (laughs) My mom prayed for me for many years when I chose to walk away and do things my own way, so I love to say that I am the product of a praying mom and God's grace. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And no matter where you are today, no matter, you know, what the sins of your your father, right? Your biological father and mother might might have been. No matter what you did yesterday, there's still a chance today. And we know that God's mercies are new every morning for those who are willing to accept him. And Jesus laid down his life for you. Hallelujah. To call you friend. Thank you, Lord, that you call me friend. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isaiah 43, 18 says, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. You know, when you come into relationship with God through Jesus Christ, the past is the past. Can we say that this morning? The past is the past. If you are willing to give up things in your past and you come to the Lord and you say, Father, forgive me, Jesus, thank you for what you did on the cross for me. Forgive me, right? You, ha- you come into that relationship. You accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Then the former things pass away. They're forgiven. Those debts are no more. You don't owe that debt anymore because Jesus paid it in full. But there are many times that we remind ourselves and we hold ourselves in bondage to things of the past, We have a hard time forgiving ourselves, right? We think about forgiveness. It can be difficult sometimes to forgive someone who's wronged us, to forgive our neighbor for certain things that get done. But you know what? Also in that bucket is self-forgiveness, and we can wrestle with that. And the enemy will try to get a stronghold, a foothold on your life by reminding you constantly of the things that you've done. But I want to tell you this morning that what Jesus did was enough. Hallelujah. What he did was enough. And so when you accept him and you come to him, right, it's nothing that you can do, but it's what Jesus already did. And the word tells us that we become new creations. We get washed clean. We become adopted into the family of God. Hallelujah. We align with God's purpose and plan for our life. And we have to lay things down. We got to lay down the past. We need to make better choices. Come on, can I get an amen this morning? We need to make better choices. The people in your life, you know, is it worth it? If maybe you just accepted Jesus, maybe you've just accepted Jesus today during this program. Maybe you've invited Jesus into your heart. That's a wonderful thing. It's the best decision that anybody can ever make. And it's the best decision that that you made today, if that's you. But I want to tell you that there's still choices and there's still some cleanup that has to happen, right? We don't just live in this this bubble where everything is perfect. We know that with God, all things are possible. We know that God doesn't leave us or forsake us, but there are choices that we need to make, things that we need to give up. And God doesn't ask us to give up things that are good for us. I want you to hear me on that. And sometimes I've heard people even say, well, the Bible's outdated. The Bible was for yesterday. Things are changing. It's progressive. Sure, the world is changing, but God's word remains the same. Hallelujah. What is written in the Bible remains the same. And so the Bible sets boundaries for us to stay safe. I want you to think about it that way. The Bible sets boundaries, lets us know what's good and what's not good for us. And giving things up, giving up addictions. Again, I'm going to get back to that. Giving up fear and doubt and worry, giving up doing things our own way. You know how tiring it is when you constantly want to do things your own way? I can tell you for myself that in my life, there was a period of time where I chose to do things my own way. I thought, well, Ashley knows best. I've got this. I was raised in a Christian home, a single parent um, household. I was raised by my mom. I just told you a little while ago, my dad was an alcoholic, so he was not in the picture. He was busy dealing with rehab and his own stuff. But my mom was a, a born again Christian, Pentecostal Christian, loved the Lord. I was raised in that environment. But then in my late teens, I didn't know what I believed anymore. 
And I think some things that I had gone through in my childhood and different influences, right, just kind of took me off course. And I did things my own way. But God was still faithful to me. God was still there for me, still provided for me. But I'm going to tell you, in doing things my own way, I never felt fulfilled. I constantly felt like I was searching, right? Things sometimes worked out, but it, it wasn't enough. And I didn't understand what was missing. But I know now when I look back, God, it was you. There's this God-shaped hole inside of each one of us, Lord, and only you can fill it. And so when we come into that relationship with, with God through Jesus Christ, through his son that he sent for us, when we come into that relationship, we start to walk in the fullness of what God has. And I'm going to tell you, control was a big thing in my life. I used to want to control every little aspect because growing up, I didn't feel like I had a lot of control. And honestly, I didn't even realize that I had built up a mechanism, a defense mechanism for myself to feel safe where I, I would, you know, I would kind of like set boxes around things. Well, if I can control this, I can control my relationships and, you know, failure is not an option in, in my job and in my career, right? All these different things. Failure in my life's not an option. But do you know how much stress that puts on a person? And stress is one of the number one killers. It really is. Stress causes a lot of harm to your body. I was constantly stressed. Did I have a roof over my head? Yes. Did I have a good job? Yes. But I didn't have God in my life. Yes, God was with me. I had accepted him when I was a child, but I wasn't choosing to walk with him. I wasn't leaning on him. I wasn't going to him in prayer. I wanted to do it my own way, like that little kid who's struggling maybe to get dressed in the morning, right? You ever see a little kid do that? I know my mom used to say this with me. I'd want to tie my own shoes or, you know, I'd want to pick out my own outfits and get ready and it would take a long time because I just wanted to do it my way. Well, as a kid, you're still learning. And you know what? A good parent usually allows the child to figure it out a little bit before they step in and help. And it's the same thing with God. He'll let us figure it out. He'll let us struggle it out until we're willing to say, Lord, will you help me with this? God, will you help me with this anxiety? Lord, will you help me with these control issues? Father, will you help me? And you know what? Strength is, is also found in humility and being able to be open and vulnerable in the sight of God. Father, I can't do this on my own and I need your help. And God, I want I want the plans that you have for my life, Lord. I want the fullness. Hallelujah. If you're listening to this this morning and you don't know the Lord, I'm going to make an opportunity for you right now. It's so simple. You just invite him into your heart. That's what an altar call is, right? It's the call of salvation. The word doesn't say that we call him, but he calls us. And so if you're listening to this and you feel moved by this message, it doesn't matter what you did yesterday. It doesn't matter what you did five minutes ago. It doesn't even matter if you've been living in addiction. If you want to choose a new way and you want to choose Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I'm going to tell you his arms are open to you this morning. And all you do is you say, Lord Jesus, I open my heart and I invite you in. Father, forgive me for all the things that I've done. And Lord, teach me your ways. Thank you for making me a new creation. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Listen, that's where it starts. It starts at the cross. And if that was you this morning and you said that prayer, you invited Jesus into your heart, I'd love to hear from you. You can reach out to me. My email is ashley at ashleyelizabeth.com. That's ashley at ashleyelizabeth.com. And you can always go to the website ashleyelizabeth.com for more information. All right, friends, we're going to end in a song this morning. It's the song Moved from my new Praise and Worship album that was released in November. You can listen to all the songs on the album. They are streaming and they're available for purchase and download everywhere that music is sold. Spotify, Apple Music. So the title of the album is moved and my name is Ashley Elizabeth so you can go ahead and check that out today you can always go to the website ashleyelizabeth.com and click on the music tab for more information or to order a hard copy all right friends enjoy this song god bless have an amazing week praying blessings for you and your family we'll see you right back here tuesday at 10 a.m for an inspirational hour called jesus and coffee time right here on 980 wcap broken heart the one the world's forgot mm -hmm. like she
sheep without a shepherd Let us stray from your pasture mm. Overwhelmed until that day Would back by your compassion Your love.